Uh, committee will come to order. Thank everyone for their indulgence uh, as we went to vote. And at this point, the chair will recognize the general lady from the District of Columbia, Ms. Holmes Norton, for her five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Larson, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this, might, this hearing might have been called Damned If You Do and Damned If You Don't. Uh, I want to congratulate you on the 30-day turnaround period for the waivers. Um, I was interested in the 94 percent of waivers. It seemed a high number. How can you explain that number? Well, um, we have a, a, a number of criteria by which we review the applications that come in, um, and the vast majority of the applicants are able to satisfy uh, the criteria that we have laid out in our uh, regs and our uh, guidance. And um, again, I think it reflects a, a, a point I made earlier that the, the goal of the waiver process is to ensure that uh, employees that have this type of coverage are able to maintain it. So the high uh, approval rate reflects kind of the criteria that we apply and the desire to maintain coverage. So we don't have people left without coverage as we convert right. from one plan to from one system or non-system to another. That's correct. Uh, the notion of transparency uh, is a serious charge. Uh, so far, uh, from what I've heard in this hearing, it, it strikes me that it is a bogus charge. But the way to show that would be to have you walk me through the process. So let's start when this bill was passed, because uh, we're coming upon the uh, anniversary. It was, I think, March 23rd or something of that yes. kind. Now, you were in the, uh, under the APA, uh, of course, there's got to be notice and comment. And so the test of transparency is what does the public know? Uh, what does the public, including those who are, are most affected on uh, either side? What does the general public know? So you had to go into uh, the public, uh, into the Federal Register. When did you go into the Federal Register? Uh, we uh, issued a, an interim final rule with a request for comments uh, in June um, of 2010. So this bill was passed in March, and within three months, you're within the federal you're in the federal register. That's correct. So people have almost immediate notice that uh, they can avoid uh, gaps in, in in coverage. Now let's go further to test the charge of lack of transparency. Um, um, did you uh, publish any guidance documents uh, that would inform someone who wanted to apply of how to apply? We, we did. We issued the first guidance uh, on September in September. I think it was September third or fourth of uh, two thousand ten. Uh, also within ninety days of the uh, issuance of the interim final rule. And then subsequent to that, we issued guidance in, in November, uh, further clarifying the criteria that we uh, had been applying. And then in December, two uh, additional guidance on issues relating to disclosure and uh, the new sales of mini meds and, and the like. Did all interested parties have the opportunity su to submit comments? Were any complaints that you didn't keep the comment period open long enough? Well, in fact, the, the guidance that we issued um, were, in many cases, in response to comments and concerns that we received and we reacted to those and would issue um, guidance in response to the feedback we got from the public or employers. Did you make adjustments based on the feedback? How would you characterize uh, what effect uh, the comment from the public had on the regular on the final regular. Well, one example of that is that um, there's concern over whether people know, for example, that their mini med policies have annual limits when we grant a waiver. And so, for example, some of the consumer groups wanted to make sure that people who had these policies were given 
notice that their policies had limited benefits. So, for example, in the guidance that we issued in the fall, we indicated that uh, people who receive waiver, waivers should uh, make sure that they are providing disclosure to people who are covered under these policies. That is a good example of how we got input about uh, public you know, disclosure of these, and then we put, we put a guidance out reflecting that input. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I just want to say, as I op open my round of questioning, I think that what the witness has just carried us through indicates that whatever problems you have with the health care bill, it is a completely bogus charge to allege that there was no transparency in this process, and I thank you. Uh, I thank the gentlelady. The Chair would now recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Walsh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Haysmeyer, let me, and I know I butchered your name, I apologize. That's okay. Let, let me, not Dr. <laughs> Mr. Let me let, have at that uh, what my colleague on the other side just mentioned. Is this, this issue of transparency, is that a bogus charge as far as you are concerned? Well, I, I really can't speak as much to that issue. I think maybe some of the others on the panel, maybe Mr. Wold could, uh, because I'm not an applicant for a waiver. Let I haven't me, been through the process. Thanks. Let me quickly go to you, Mr. Wold. Just a opine. Is is this is that a bogus charge? The transparency. That's a tough question. I, you know, I think as a, a benefits attorney. The transparency m means something different to me than to maybe uh, an employer who sponsors one of these plans. Um, given the fact, um, you know, that I have access to information and have resources that aren't generally used by employers, and so, from my perspective, you know, we were able to follow the mm -hmm. different pieces of guidance. I don't know, uh, you know, some of our employers, some of our clients had not heard anything about it. Um, until okay. we inform them about it. Okay. So. Mr. Larson, according to the HHS annual limits review and evaluation standard operating procedures, HHS employees must specifically look for whether applicants are unions. Uh, no similar consideration is made for small businesses. And in fact, unions are provided two special criteria for flexibility. Uh, criteria not given to other hourly wage employer groups such as restaurants retail industry or seasonal workers. Does Obamacare provide special consideration for unions and not for small businesses? Um, we, in implementing the waiver process, do not provide any special treatment for any particular type of applicant or applicants from a particular sector in administering the program. Why were HHS employees instructed to specifically look for whether applicants are unions? I, I don't recall uh, that the standard operating procedures kind of describe it in that way. It may just be because we categorize whether they are Taft-Hartley plans or whether they are self-insured plans. So we categorize the type of applicant. But if someone is categorized as a Taft-Hartley or self-insured or union plan, they, they don't get any different treatment or there are no different criteria applied to them. So, uh, Mr. Haysmeyer, um, mm -hmm. did you have a, do you have a thought on that issue? Um, yeah, it is a little far afield, but it is an interesting question that is kind of, well, it is not far afield, it is it's tangential to this, but it is an interesting question. This particular statute is part of what is known as Title 27 of the Public Health Service Act, which was originally put in as uh, part of the Health Insurance Portability Accountability Act in 96. And uh, there is the question of regulating insurers and the question of regulating employer plans. Now, what is interesting about this is under prior law, uh, HIPAA, ERISA, COBRA, et cetera, this, this regulation of whether an employer plan passes muster would have been the Department of Labor. Mm -hmm. Uh, and in fact, if you look at these regulations, they are jointly issued, as were the HIPAA regulations, because any of these Title 27s are, uh, because of the joint jurisdiction, by HHS, uh, Labor, and Treasury. 
the interesting question to me is how in that process did the administration suddenly decide that now HHS was going to regulate employee benefit plans? How do you think that did? I don't know. I mean, but it's an interesting kind of jurisdictional question um, that you might want to look into because, I mean, I know the people at the Employee Benefit Security Administration over at Labor. I've worked with them in the past, and that's traditionally where this kind of thing would go. I think Mr. Larson's answer that, yes, you have these different kinds of plans. There's the multi-employer, Taft, Hartley, Union Trust. Um, I mean, these are things that that department, that agency at, at Labor deals with all the time. Uh, somehow in this jointly issued reg, uh, several things happened that are, to me, quite surprising. You know, one, they took what was Congress's instruction to define a term, meaning to set a number, and they turned it into three numbers over three years, an escalation, and suddenly we're talking about a phase out, which isn't in the statute. They then instituted a waiver process from that phase out which, again, as I pointed out, is not authorized in the statute in spite of Congress in 21 other places in the statute explicitly authorizing a waiver process. Uh, and now they've put the enforcement and the regulation not just on insurers but on employer plans with Mr. Larson and HHS, which is just contrary to the normal practice that we've had in the past in this area of law. So I, I, I don't know why. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Walsh. The Chair will now recognize the Chairman of the full committee, the gentleman from California, Mr. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Larson, uh, I'm still a little baffled uh, about this question of if, if it doesn't matter if somebody is unionized or not, why would you put an SOP to recognize whether they are covered under a union contract? What is the purpose? The, the purpose in setting out the categories is that depending on the applicant, um, for example, if an insured plan applies, you have premiums that are associated with uh, the coverage. If you have, for example, a self-insured plan or in some cases a collectively bargained plan, you will have premium equivalents as a... As a in Obamacare, as a, as a matter of law, is that, is that specified? I'm sorry, what is your well, question? I hear all of that, that but the, the fact is that uh, if you put into a, a waiver authority the information, then we have to presume the information was seen, and if the information was seen, it can have an effect on granting or not granting, right? Uh, I wouldn't say that that's true. In the case of unions, unions, um, they were But the people were approving the, waivers know who they are approving and they know what their category is, right? Well, they are aware of how the plans are categorized, but it doesn't impact how they well, Let the me ask a broader question. With all due respect, aren't we disenfranchising smaller businesses by granting waivers, which inherently are by those who are smart enough and can afford to come and do it? Uh, Mr. Hasselmeyer, don't we inherently have in this various application process not only things which are extra or outside the, the legislation and therefore not lawful to be done by the administration. And if they need to do it, they need to come back for authority, which they haven't sought. But haven't we, are, don't we also have a situation in which we are inherently disenfranchising the vast majority who do not have a financial capability of coming and asking for waivers because the cost of, of going through the waiver process would be greater than the savings? Well, well Mr. Chairman, I, I, I did in my testimony, my prepared testimony, address that at the end and said there is a legal question, as, you, as, as we both talked about as to whether this, the Department actually has the authority. But yes, there is this policy question of this kind of a waiver process in this or other circumstances where uh, rather than drawing a line that anybody can look up and see which side of the line they are on, you are saying, well, come and ask us and maybe we will let you know. Uh, yeah, that, that that will have at least the perception, if not the reality, of tending to favor those who are larger and better resourced than those who are smaller and less aware and less resourced. So, yes. doesn't, doesn't, have this, doesn't this committee and the Congress have an obligation under equal protection to find out, in fact, who the disenfranchised are and see that they are given equal opportunity? That is what public service announcements are all about, is trying to inform the public. Do any of you know of any effort by the administration to inform the employer public or the insurance public that they can receive these uh, waivers and to make the cost of doing it de minimis? Is there any program of that sort? Well, as I, as I testified earlier, we put out uh, the bulletins 
A bulletin. Did press I, you know, I'm an employer. Press, I'm an employer. Where, where would I have read that that bulletin? Well, what we found is that the, the 30 percent of the applicants that we um, processed were small businesses. They had 100 enrollees. And where did they find out about this? Uh, well, we didn't ask them how, but I guess the point is that they were. Oh, come they on! Were you able you advertise, and then you say you didn't ask how. I've never seen anyone come in that they didn't ask. Well, how did you find out about this program? So, how do you gauge the effectiveness of your advertising? Or another way of how do you gauge the effectiveness of spending the taxpayers' money? Well, we're we're always open to suggestions for getting the word. No, no, I'm not asking. I'm asking how do you do it? How do we do what? Look, Obamacare is an abysmal failure, and people are being hurt out there by rising health costs. And then there's a waiver program that seems to select winners and losers fairly arbitrarily. How do you defend? that process, and more importantly, how do you know you are effectively reaching out to all of those who could be entitled to the lottery of can I opt out or not? Well, it is a good process. We have 30 percent of the small businesses that uh, are approved. Uh, we are able to maintain coverage for over What percentage people. of the American public has been approved? How many, what percentage of these waivers, what do they represent in percentage of the insured America that is now wavered out? I, I do know that <clears throat> these waivers account for about 2 percent, a very small percent of those who have employer-based coverage. Of okay. So is there anybody else here that sees a problem with 2 percent opting out on a program that, in fact, is not ready for prime time? That that's a rhetorical question for which I'm I'm Mr. Hasselmeyer, if you like to weigh in, I'm 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 astounded that we're having a hearing, and every answer is we don't know. We'll check into it. We think the process was fair. We don't have answers to that. We don't think that's true. I want I simply have one closing question. If only two percent have it, if there is no there is no affirmative plan to enable small businesses, of which I have some to avail themselves of it, then how can we feel that, that it is being done fairly for the 2 percent that are getting to opt out of, a great many of which are, if you will, uh, the already advantaged uh, groups of society? Yes, sir. Well, I, I would say that that is exactly the kind of problem that this sort of situation creates, that it is difficult uh, for anyone, Mr. Larson or anyone else, enforcing this to counter the perception that this is not the rule of law, that this is actually the rule of who you know. Uh, and that is why the whole mechanism, no matter how fairly or how generously one attempts to administer it, the entire mechanism is suspect, in my view, because of that. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you for shedding light on this problem of the 2 percent versus the rest of America. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, members will have five legislative days to insert comments for the record. I want to thank on behalf of everyone uh, on the uh, subcommittee and, and those who are not on the subcommittee but on the full committee that were gracious enough to join us. I want to join them in thanking you for your uh, time and your collegiality and professionalism in answering the questions. Uh, the committee stands adjourned.